Okay, everybody, so this is Don, and tonight we're at Miskatonic Brewing in Darien, Illinois. Got my Foundations of Beer course at College of DuPage. We're talking about beer uh, with Marty Nacho, learning about the brewing process, and we're going to take a little tour of Miskatonic. Now, this is a live stream. This isn't some put-together video, so there's going to be a lot of screw-ups, a lot of whatever, but it's a lot of fun. Um, don't know if you guys have been here before, but I'm in this back room, which is interesting, um, but they got these glass doors. Um, we put the chairs there because people were just like walking in the doors, but cool space. We're gonna go out into the room here, check some things out. We're out here, see some people. We got the Lou Dog crew here. I'm sure your boss will jump on. <laughs> so I know some of you are gonna watch this live and some of you are gonna be jumping on later, but if you have questions, uh, type them in. We'll try and, you know, we're going to be talking about the brewing process. We'll we'll try and ask some questions. So, you want to know about mashing or uh, uh, fermentation, whatever it is. Um, throw the questions out there and we'll see. You know, uh, it's a little loud in here. The, you know, might not be able to hear me too well, but here, I get myself with the art. Yeah, thank you. But yeah, so we're just kind of waiting to go back. Um, Take a look at some stuff here. Jason Prisney and Dennis Wingert have joined. The, the other beer dog crew. What's up, fellas? Can you hear me? Facebook is a little delayed. I know for some of my audience, we're on Periscope or you know, Meerkat or whatever. It's a little bit easier. It's more live. Facebook, there's a little bit of a delay, but you know, we're doing our thing. What's up, fellas? Just hanging out. So I've only tried one beer. I tried the uh, Catch Penny. It was like a, a session rye. So it was actually very good. But I have not been here before, which, which is good. You know, I like checking out new places. But so, yeah, see those. So we were in the back room with the glass doors, and two people walked in, like smashed into the, the windows. I. I uh, I felt bad. So, okay. So when you post, okay. So when you post it, even in the Facebook Live, it's going to show up as Beer Dog. Okay. So I got some of the Beer Dog crew have joined us as well. That's nice. Yeah, it's a nice little space. We got this little guy up here. I don't know what that is. I like the I like the art. But, you know, it's, what I really like is the outside where they got that cool like chick with the umbrella deal on the door right? it's a it's a nice little place um, they're not little they get, it's actually decent size but they like their stuffed animals just, I don't know if I can zoom in but oh I can you see they got some kind of like spider thing going on in the, the barrels which cool sure it's probably right up Pippi's wheelhouse that's you know so well, nice, but yeah, I'm just sitting here. No beer though. I uh, I should have grabbed one first, but you, you live and you learn. So. But uh, so today uh, on Snapchat we had a big day. We were talking about why you shouldn't swish around the beer in your mouth like you do with wine. Um, we did a little experiment and I kind of wore it. I posted a picture, a little video snippet earlier on Facebook, but it got pretty nasty. Um, what was funny is uh, about 10 minutes after that happened, I actually had to go uh, talk to my daughter's uh, teacher of preschool. So got my shirt covered in beer. I'm sure I made a great impression. What can you do? Barrels, yes. Is that, so who's taught, who is that? Is that Denny or Jay or? This guy's doing. He looks like he's working hard. You can go right in front of me, right? Uh, okay. Some of our students here, they got they got themselves a beer. I should have done one more myself, but yeah. 
It's Jay. Awesome. Very nice. I think you guys have been here, right? I think so. Huh. Kind of like that logo. I might even get one of those shirt meals. Uh, that might be interesting. So. So yeah, I'm just waiting here to be able to go back and check things out. Um, I see some barrels, which like barrels. Ready? Oh, oh, I'm asking you a beer. Uh, yeah, I love one. Um, that uh, that session rye was good. The penny catcher. I'll give you money. Someone's buying me a beer. Free beer. That's good. So, that trimmed up the beard a little bit. It was getting a little out of control. Um, we tried to do the Chester A. Arthur competition where I was going to grow it out and then to shave this. Hey, Zach, how's it going? Now, Jay, I know you know who Chester A. Arthur is, but half the people didn't know what it was. But I was going to try and do one of those to shave all this and grow that out. So, is that mine, Marty? Thank you. So, yeah, session ride. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I try to keep it light when I'm driving. You know, you got to be careful out there. So, that's that's one of the reasons I chose this. There's a couple other ones that were like seven or eight, nine percent. I kind of chat away, but you know, at least I can maybe drink a few. How's it going, Zach? How are you? Glad to see you. Yeah. I want to get going with this tour. Getting impatient. We go back, we got the Lou Dog team. Always schmoozing, selling tickets, making stuff happen. So if you guys have been here, um, leave a comment. Let me know. Uh, even if you're watching it on the replay, that would be cool too. Uh, I know it's a brew that's not brand new, but it's new-ish. Uh, and I think a lot of people have not been here and kind of close to my old uh, stomping grounds in, in Westmont, um, which is good. It's, my wife's parents are still back there, and uh, my mom is in the area, so that'd be somewhere I can come get a growler fill. I'll, I don't have all the info. I don't know exactly what the growlers look like or whatever yet. I haven't made my way up to the bar, but you know we'll we'll get some of that. Anybody have any questions for me? What would be great is if you have any questions that I can ask the head brewer on the tour. That would be awesome. That would be really awesome. Oh, that's kind of This is live streaming, folks. I know the beer community is kind of new to it. Uh, we're used to like high quality professional videos. Um, I've been working doing live streaming for about the last year or so, year and a half, uh, with a lot of some of the, the platforms that have come out. And Dennis is in. You know, we've we were old UStream guys, uh, but now just the way live streaming is working with the interactivity, um, and Periscope and Meerkat, um, working with a lot of businesses, uh, coming up with uh, uh, way to develop content there, being a live streaming strategist too. Um, it's really cool now with. The updates for Facebook Live, I think this is when mainstream uh, beer community gets in. Kind of like uh, how mainstream beer community is starting to get into Snapchat. So. You guys probably don't want to look at me. Look at, look at this little guy serving beer. Let's take a walk over here. All right, so the bar's nice.
Okay, it's a nice bar. A little poster deal. It's nice. Okay, so there's some guys. Alright, cool. A lot of equipment back there. I want to know the story with the spider. I think that's going to be cool. I'm all about it. Alright, and um, here we go. Marty's ready. I'm ready. He's ready. We're all we're ready to go. This is John. He's the man. Come in, say hi. Wonderful guy. John, he's he's the man here at Whiskey Town. I would have the microphone on, but I just don't think it'll pick him up. It's way too noisy, so I'm just gonna keep it on me, and I'll just maybe repeat some things. It's kind of like uh, you know when you're watching those UN recordings where you got the international person translating. That's 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 what I'm doing. From Bree Small. Bree chills about 175 miles from here. Most of their. Kind of local, uh, like you're saying. Within a couple hundred miles. It's pretty close. Hot. Uh, Michigan, we tried the short. Chilton, Wisconsin. Denny, I'm sure you're on. You know the high school and the mascot, but if you do, you're, you're sick of it. Great Lakes Water. Talking yeast. We're making yeast for all you yeast fans. They do a lot of very cool blends. If you're into sour or Belgian yeast, some very, very interesting stuff. Uh, so it's a, lot, it's a lot nicer to drive to the north side, pick up some ribs and some, some yeast than it is to hopefully in the winter not get your yeast stuck at a FedEx depot in Utah. I have sweated a 15 barrel pitch that costs $600. Weather is not refund worth it. I don't know where that is in the warehouse team of FedEx and Kentucky. I don't know if it's cold, I don't know if it's a boiler room, I don't know if it's out of the country, it's freezing. If I can drive my ass to Montrose and pick up the yeast, I'm much happier right now. Um, Marty talked a lot about uh, uh, the germination and the malting process. Um, when we brew it, it starts. We're talking germination and malt. Grist uh, milk. We're going to look at the grist milk. So we're, you know, like you say, you're busting the grain in two, three little pieces. We're not making, we're not making bread here. It's not flour. Follow it. Mm -hmm. 
There we go. It's like Willy Wonka did, folks. What's up, Josh? We're learning about Millie. It's awesome. Seriously. Motor on the grist case, folks. Oh, we're going in. Jacketed mash water. Plates? So essentially it's just separating the, the liquid from the husk here. Kind of the same thing you do with homebrew, but... This is the, by the way, 50 barrel, two vessels. Uh, brew house is going to be two, three, four. Uh, this is mash water. Mash is where you mix it together and bring the water and separation process. That can be two, three, four. The mash water action. Uh, the other vessel over there is a kettle uh, whirlpool. That can also be two vessels. The more vessels you have, the more actual batches of beer you can have going at the same time. So if I'm moving, my, my boil is almost over. He's making a great point here now. You know, some brews are a little, little simple, some are more complex, but the more vessels you have going on, the, the more batches you can have, more stages, uh, which is an excellent point because you know, there is definitely art to beer, there's no question, but um, there's a lot of logistics that make a huge difference. Talking about timing, so he, he does 45 minutes or so. What's up, Josh? Hopefully, we'll be at that point sometime soon. Uh, we do not have rakes. A lot of times in Mash Town, you'll see uh, a boom here at the top with rakes down like this, and they'll be sort of swiggly and they'll be a plate at the bottom. And they'll go like this. The idea being, if your mash gets stuck, if liquid isn't draining through that bed effectively, you couldn't cut the bed. Do that too often, the water will just sort of the sparge and your cream will just sort of follow that little track. It won't pick up very much sugar until it's very hot. You want to avoid that if you can. Proper crush and proper pH. Phosphoric food grade acids, I use to treat the pH rate. Which is a malt that's not prepared. Talking about not using rakes. Um, following the process, using things like phosphoric acid. Uh, we so, have there's so much food science involved in this. Uh, 
you know, it's, it can be hard for a lot of the home brewers to make sense of this. We have big paddles like that. It allows us to stir the mash so that the, uh, the steam jackets that are on the side, we can step mash and we can start at 140, 120, step up to another temperature. Let's talk a little bit about step mashing now. No, as I'm trying to stop and not kill myself. Um, a lot of a lot of complexity with that. We're not going to go into all of it. In this class, it's we're keeping it basic. So our foundations of beer. So you know, we may mention step mashing, but it's it's not on the test, folks. talking about pumping, not out of this vessel, but out of this one, because uh, he doesn't want to create suction. I don't know, Mike. Mike Newton, thanks for the comment. How often? I'm not sure. Um, we had a special arrangement to bring our class here, um, but I think they did a tour earlier, so I would check out the website, um, or if, you know, maybe I can, I'll ask uh, John and I'll just post it later. That's cool, too. Yeah, I mean, he knows the stuff. So about an hour 40 to run off from MASH all the way through. for hanging out, Mike. That's cool. I'm just trying to introduce the beer world to live streaming. So he's saying he's got non-dimple jackets, so he boils a little bit longer. Which, at this point, it doesn't mean it's bad. It just means, you know, save a little money here to do something here. Talking about the open jackets. Talking about the connections. The dimple, the steam's forced towards specific things. So it's a more effective transfer of steam energy with the dimple jacket, but you know, he says to you know, compensate for it. I am going to just drop my beer glass off. And now we're two hands. Not, now you have, and I get the open hand.
Monday. Matt Burleson brought to you the Salem. It's the way the Salem does its hockey beer. It's the way our team longer does its hockey beer. Uh, the general idea is it's a less intense, less harsh beer. Checking this bad boy out. So cooling in quickly is something to be concerned about. Um, the fermenters, cylindro conical fermenters. Uh, conical is important. Um, yeast will travel on currents, on conduction. Uh, uh, the four, the three things yeast create, CO2, heat, and alcohol. Okay. CO2 is toxic, that's why it bubbles out. Heat's pretty much toxic, that's why the manways are inset. These tanks are insulated, we bring glycol through them to keep the temperature perfect for fermentation. About 67 for ales, about 15. Talking about lagers. running glycol for temperature uh, of the fermentation tanks. That's 67. Um, but we don't for want to ales. Keep that one in. So, unfortunately, at a certain point, uh, depending on the heat strain, it's going to be uh, fatigue from processing all that and dealing with that one ingredient we can't mitigate, the alcohol. So, it'll get tired, it'll sort of shut down. Another reason we have the cone is it acts as a funnel. If all the yeast sort of falls down into the funnel, it's easier us, easy enough for us to take it out of the tank and put it in the tank. We do a fair amount of cone to cone pitching here. Um, we have a hemocytometer, but we don't have a working microscope. We don't actually do yeast counts. We do uh, timed and weight pitching, and we do um, we know what the volumes are at the various uh, heights of the cone. So uh, we do studies about what yeast viability is at certain points, and we make educated guesses. You know, uh, on my lab wish list is a, uh, a microscope, so I use my hemocytometer. A hemocytometer is a uh, uh, it's a specialty slide that used to allow labs to count blood cells in chemo. Uh, we don't count those cells; we count yeast cells. I'm talking about. Uh, if you, if you want to buy John a gift, needs needs a. He needs a microscope. He needs a microscope. You can put some of that so he counts, count yeast. Yeah. Yeah, well, you guys should all pitch in and buy him one. Of the yeast cells that are dead. But if the yeast cell's alive, it has a fairy that prevents the chemical from soaking into the cell. So if you do a count that way, you can not only tell how many cells are in a measured quantity of yeast, but you can also tell which ones are dead. So you can get a viability count and say, hey, my yeast is 87% viable. This is good. You can also tell, hey, there's four million cells per milliliter, so I can know how much you want to take. So, uh, uh, a simple student uh, nice microscope, and a $30 piece of give me essentially uh, equipment. You know, uh, all this yeast talk get is a real handle on how much would be appropriate. Give me some sweats about my old uh, uh, pre med days. Too, too much, and you can create all flavors there as well. Uh, so, it's an important thing. I told myself by the 12th month we'll have that in operation. Two months ago. So, uh, feverishly looking for a uh, lower price of your um, Fermentation time. Uh, we have a fairly fermentation. alcohol tolerant British strain. Uh, it's not super estery. You know, it's no esters. Uh, it's kind of a compound that creates a fruity aroma and flavor. Uh, usually a stone fruit kind of thing. Uh, it's a hallmark of a lot of. of, of of uh, uh, British beers, uh, also Belgians, uh, you'll get a lot of sort of super intense hits of fruit, those are esters. Uh, it produces some, but not a lot, so we have sort of a grumpy style uh, that we can create with the strain. Uh, the only downside is because it is so alcohol tolerant, it tends to finish lower. So it eats more sugar than another maybe non-alcoholic strain to sort of poop out early. So sometimes, uh, depending on the recipe style, if you want something with a little more body, we have to compensate on the malt side, because you know that yeast strain is going to create fairly dry beer. Uh, we have sort of lower our mash temperatures so that we get talking more about, Right now we're but talking about the new style. Uh, uh, yes. Ferments out pretty well. Creates a very oh, dry yeah. beer. So, you know, 
so then you just to compensate that with uh, grain bill, things like that. Uh, we're probably using that strain. Now we do very, uh, uh, you know, it's chapter four on the menu. We have a rotating IPA, so uh, um, we'll change the yeast strain. Um, there's a Norwegian yeast strain uh, that's similar to a Belgian where um, the yeast lab told us not to put cooling on it, just let it get as hot as it wants. And don't cool it in too much. I'm like, you pull my leg, because normally you cool it at about 62 degrees. 68 is a high temperature cooling for a lot of these. It's like, yeah, cool in about 75, 80. And I'm like, if this yeast dies, I'm coming for you. That's a lot of beer. And he goes, trust me, it'll be fine. Don't turn the cooling off. God, it's about 92 degrees. Unbelievably, really super intense orange rind ester from that yeast. Uh, I did a little research about the Norwegian homebrew community. When they ferment, instead of trying to keep their carboy cool, they actually wrap it in insulation and put lids on it to keep the heat inside so that when, they, the, when, the, when the yeast creates heat, it doesn't dissipate, it stays in there like they're trying to cook it. It's really freaky, but it was a very fun yeast cream, something that we will definitely be using again. But yeah, for the majority of our beers, if it's an English style or uh, an American style, it's generally going to be that strain. Low enough esters and we we'll probably get away with it with American strain. It's a Belgian, obviously, we're going to use a Belgian strain. Uh, our, our fermentations are often done uh, days four through six. Um, I'll talk about to scheduling. Be safe, you don't really touch anything as far as uh, moving yeast. This is the non fun seven, stuff uh, of doing. So, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the essential. Yeast to reuptake something that will break diacetyl later. Uh, diacetyl is a, a funky thing that makes booby bot corn taste like butter. It's really kind of silky and disgusting and slippery. Um, this strain is actually, it doesn't really kick out a lot of diacetyl, so. Because we have the time at this stage, we probably go maybe three days uh, extra beyond terminal so that we can feel like the diacetyl has been re upped. Um, at that point, we will crash it. Uh, we do fining, we don't filter here yet. Uh, when we have issues with soft ability and shelf stability, we are moving our beer beyond the Chicago line market. If we're going to Ohio or Michigan or Wisconsin, uh, you add days in the distribution chain. You don't know where your beer is going to be. We had a dot in August in Wisconsin. I don't know. Shelf stability becomes crucial at that point. Now it's important. Then it's crucial. At that point, we'll probably move to either a plate frame or a isolation earth filter so that we can remove proteins and other compounds that are going to shorten its shelf life. Uh, right now, we can do it with fining. Our product moves pretty quickly in the marketplace. Uh, when we're just in the Chicagoland area, we're not really seeing our beer take more than you know, two or three months of pumps get out and be drunk. So, uh, a lot of times it's allocated rather quickly, so we really don't have to worry about it languishing in a warehouse. Right now we're just pegs, so uh, our distributor is Windy City. They have a lot of cold stores, so um, you know we feel like our product is being taken well care of. Uh, when we do do a lager, uh, the fermentation is easily 10 or 12 days. Uh, 14 is not unheard of. Uh, sometimes we get a pitch from the lab. That first fermentation is a little bit sluggish. Usually the second one is bad out of hell. You can hear that one rocking. Um, tomorrow that'll probably be crusted because we need a double, so I'm assuming the croix is going to get so big it's going to come down the block tube and it's going to look like uh, like meringue up in that bucket. It's a real pain in the butt to clean, too. Um, so yeah, usually the second and third generation that we use the EPs. If you guys can hear this, but... It ferments up rather quickly. Uh, when I was at Goose Island, the three months you used to ferment out for 46 hours. Reason that particular recipe would ferment out 30% you know, faster than a other ale of a similar flavor. So occasionally we have, usually in like the third or fourth generation of yeast, one where it just goes insanely quick. Uh, so crashing time, a little bit fining. We send it to our bray tank, which is uh, on the other side there. We'll walk around a little bit. We'll talk about what's going on over there. That's a cold water tank. Uh, brewers refer to water as liquor, so I'll say cold liquor tank. Or liquor tank. It's very confusing for tours. Uh, probably call it water liquor because we drink a lot. I really have no explanation for why we would make that so unnecessarily confusing. Exactly. Our hot liquor tanks in the back there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the there's the hot liquor tank. Um, let's see. Yeah, let's, let's walk around. Are there any questions about what we're talking about so far? No, but you say we have Lake Michigan water. Are you filtering it yet at all? Uh, the only thing we do to the water is we put it through a toothpaste filter that takes out sediment. Talking about the water uh, filter, they use uh, uh, Michigan water, but it's a little, couple little steps after the they build a lot of it. Uh, we'd rather do it each 
step so that we can control. I don't want to do something in a blanket. I want to look at it in each step and say, the pH is correct here. It's a little out here. I want to correct it a little bit here. So we sort of do it as we go along. So as they go along from each step, they correct. You know, so they can take a look at step, uh, step two and say, you know, the pH is off. PH you know, we're going to fix it here. To find out how our spark is doing. We do a pedal full and we do a whirlpool. So obviously, whirlpool, you can't do anything. It's ready to go. But up until that point, we're monitoring the pH and the gravity when we're appropriate. Very cool. How many barrels do you guys think in the main this year? Question, uh, how many barrels? Year, we're, we're in month nine right now. So we're month looking at nine. between 8,000 barrels. Uh, we are negotiating on the space next door. Uh, once that negotiation is to the point so where we feel comfortable, trying to get near a thousand go, barrels. Uh, we're ordering four more of these uh, that will go right behind these. We, we built the pads to sort of take uh, this is expansion one, the next pad is expansion two, and then where the kegs are, another pad will be built. We already have the, the header for the glide bomb. So um, we've gotten to the point now that there's so many 15 and 30 barrel breweries that these are actually stocked places. The way they stock toilet paper at Costco. Yeah. So I can call GW Count on a Thursday. I can have four of these here Tuesday. I can have riggers hook up my glycol in four hours. Are these 30 yeah. These are 30. All of our fermenters are double sized. Yeah. 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 So I can order on Thursday. I can be brewing the following Wednesday. So um, that's why we built the header the way we did. We spent an extra, I think, 10 grand for that to do it right away so that when we did expansions, it was boom, the expansions happened. Um, another part of you know dealing with the shekels. Um, cool flexibility. You know, um, it's nice to have a distributor that has the confidence to say, anytime you want the canning line, um, you know, Mariano's is interested. They Mariano's called the distributor and said, when are they canning? So um, uh, yeah, the distributor has a has a big part of it. I mean, it's, this whole operation is me, Josh, and Dave. We have a couple of bartenders that fill in here and there, but uh, Josh does uh, a big chunk of the selling. So, um, yeah, Windy City does a lot of heavy lifting for us. Who's stripping draft right now? Yeah, the uh, canning is part of Well, the canning line is supposedly third week in May. Well, that target keeps moving around depending on what you call. Uh, but it looks uh, like if all goes third well, week in we May, can put things in the in the month of June. Uh, so that means end of July at your store, theoretically. But, uh, Again, everything so is theoretically. Look for it late summer, uh, July, July some cans. Uh, one weird hiccup in the delivery. Awesome, what? Sort of get out. In theory. The trick is trying to figure out when the liquid goes. Is it, is it always works in the beer industry? It's, 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 that, means, really that means October. Yeah. But no, I'm just kidding. Down, so, it could be. Uh, it gets to be a little dicey. Don't, don't get too excited. You heard, you heard it from Enrique. So we're walking. Barrels. Pretty. Can't too late to the party. Uh, their scheduling is, they're so good. Uh, actually, at one point, we're going to buy one of the mobile canning line standing lines because they had to buy one that was twice as big. And that sold in four days. So, uh, yeah, it gets to a point where timing does play an enormous role in that. And everything about a startup is being able to move really fast. And, and you know, make a decision and go. Like I am analytical. I like to sit and ruminate on stuff. That that that, that doesn't happen here. So it's a weird way for me to live. Uh, you'll notice we had a pilot barrel aging system. Um, I don't know if we're ever going to get Goose Island size, which is like what uh, I think it's five football fields in there. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's stuff now. Um, but this is this is the start. So the first four are uh, bullet rye uh, bourbon barrels. Filled with Brendel, so which is a bullet ride bourbon a, barrels. Think of a barley wine, slightly less. With a barley wine less inside. Cheese. So sort of an easier to drink. Works for me. Percent barley wine, for lack of a more elegant way. To Everybody loves a barrel aged beer, uh, right? Those uh, went in October, I think. The next four are Ingenue, which is our Belgian farmhouse, which just stays on essentially. Uh, some Chardonnay barrels from Napa. Uh, those. Got our little spiders. Four months was March. Probably got about another two to go. Uh, they're picking up less and less oak and finished characters, so those will come out. We will put something in there with bugs. Uh, we sort of de oak them slightly. Uh, so now they'll just be a sort of a house for, you know, Pedio and Brett for the most part. Um, wine barrels are super sturdy by comparison. They're not charred in the same way that the ins. Have you ever 
broken open a, a whiskey or bourbon barrel, I mean, it's a mess in there. So uh, structurally, they're always so much beefier. So we'll use a lot of the wine barrels we use to um, act as fermentation and aging vessels for sour and wild projects. Yeah, I'm talking about some or sour projects. Our, the Revenant, which is our imperial stout. Very nice. You're taking out some of that uh, wood character with one batch and coming in again and making it kind of a house for all your all the bugs. Tailwinds and Plainfield. Uh, the Tailwind barrel is special because they actually won Best Amber Rum in competition with, with that barrel. They want that one back. They're going to make an Imperial Stout Rum with that one. Which I told them only if we get it back after that. We'll just keep going into the barrel for so hard. Uh, we're trying to navigate the idea of getting... You know, we start, we're talking about some type of collaboration with uh, Tailwinds, and this is what's cool. Their Tailwinds, uh, when they throw out in Plainfield, they make a great rum. When they won an award with the rum, they bring him the barrel. He's going to make some type of a stout in this rum barrel. And when they want it back, and they're going to make a, you know, a, a stout-flavored rum, and then he can get it back. And, you know, just like ping-pong, back and forth. And, and in the end, we all win. So that's, that's craft beer, folks. That's it. Aged beer in there, and then sort of pull it out and uh, <laughs> sort of have them uh, have them be for bars to put mixed drinks in and serve out of it. Uh, so it would be a cocktail inspired by one of our beers and sort of flavored by one of our beers. Goose did it once with Manhattan with the Violet Hour with the Bourbon County Bar. Uh, pretty sure it's really, really illegal. Um, but we, we haven't quite navigated that yet. But it might be something coming up. Um, this will expand. We've got some, some wild turkey barrels. We'll see some red wine barrels over there. That's going to be a uh, Flanders Red project. That's probably happening in the next couple of months. Wow. Um, It'll be a Flanders Red project. Some barrels back there. The barrels were price right, so they're going to be stuck somewhere. So um, uh, when, we do, when we do barrel projects, we'll probably do those in bottles. So we're going to set up sort of a small... Uh, Counter flow sort of rack system where it slides up and down and we can put bottles in it. Uh, Penrose has built something sort of similar. Ours is going to be more semi automatic um, so that we can do sort of small two and four packs of, of barrel aged high gravity. Did so you mention that you're producing bugs for your beer? Yes. Are you, not, I mean, are you going to set that aside somewhere? Separate room, separate anything? Uh, at some point, yes, but up to that point, no. Uh, we'll do. About um, if I hadn't worked at Goose for six years, I probably would. Um, not knowing what Brett did in what 2000 and, uh, 2005, uh, trying to figure out how to make Brett grow, we basically would read white papers from the wine industry describing how to kill it. Because in wine, bread is a huge no-no. So now we're talking about bread. And you, back at the goose days, they had no knowledge so of how to make bread grow. So they actually read wine papers. And if you know wine, bread is bad in wine. So he, they would actually read papers about learning how winemakers killed bread and kind of reverse engineer the growth. Wild flavors, right? It's pretty awesome. You'd have the lab come up. The lab would come up to me. It's a true story. Steal on that one. 200 barrel tank, right? That's 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 going right to my Snapchat. Yeah, it's good stuff. And I'm like, I'm not sure I can meet the volumetric plus two four with any accuracy. It's meant to do a lot more than that. So we actually pitched from a from a Brett Brink into the tank with four barrels, and then we recirc it and then clean the crap out of the pump. But um, you know, we had a lab, we had a gas chromatograph. You know, a lot of it was. Um, there's a lot of testing, so uh, I think we'll probably do really small brick projects until we feel like we can sort of analyze what we're doing. Um, you know, things like an ATP meter, which is a, uh, it's a, it's a little handheld computer. You get these swabs, okay? and when you clean a tank, you could rub the swab on the inside of the tank. It actually measures ATP, which is a it's the part of a cell that creates energy. Just talking science, we're gonna. That's pretty.
He's about to retire. So he thinks. Um, so he'll be the one sort of helping me look at you know, a couple of papers coming out of the West Coast and a lot of stuff from the American Society. Uh, we're in chemists and we're going to sort of have him double check all my work. So, uh, yeah, there will come a point where we will have one bright that's just for wild beers and Belgians. And we will probably have one bright tank on the other side and one bright tank in here and lots of nice place. That's really far down. I think we can do smaller ones. Time will tell. We get a really, really ready test tank. We'll hope for the best. Any other questions about, about this side or any other stuff? About What's with the spider? Or? What's with the spider? Uh, he's <laughs> our plague doctor. He, he makes sure that nothing wrong goes wrong. Okay. Um, I, I, I like it. That never got put away. Yeah, later, she got the one, on, the thing over there yeah, too. That's, that's Trin. That's Trinity. Our, our, she's our, um, she's our, she's our other stuff mascot. Nice. Miskatonic is a, uh, is a, a fictional river valley in the writings of a 1920s horror author named H.P. Lovecraft. If anyone's into weird sort of uh, horror stuff, that's that's Lovecraft. Not a lot of people know Lovecraft, but everyone knows who he influenced Stephen King. The Alien and Aliens is H.R. Geiger's of Lovecraft Nut, the Monsters and Ghostbusters. Uh, we like the rift of um, uh, standing on the shoulders of giants, the way the creative process is always influenced by people before. It also gives us the opportunity to make really cool food and funky and creepy beer names and stuff. So, you know, we're, we're, a bit, we're a bit of nerds here. It, show, it shows the people. Nice. Very cool. If there's any other questions, we can head back. You guys can have a career. You can wrap up in there. Where would you like to be? Yeah, I'd go back to the uh, to the room very briefly. Uh, so it looks like that pretty much wraps up the tour. So um, it's a place you can check out. That's that's for sure. Um, they're growing. Things are happening, just like it does with a lot of craft brewers. John's a very knowledgeable guy, um, and. Uh, Somebody's happy. Awesome. Yeah, so, but yeah, um, we'll do more live streams. If you have a brewery or you have a bar or a beer restaurant, or whatever, let me know. Maybe we'll come out and live stream your thing. But um, this is Don. You know, keep on beer dogging, and then you know, we'll see you guys uh, bright and early tomorrow morning. Snapchat. See you, folks.